Centennial Valley is different than other places in the West. Here we have private livestock producers, government agencies, and nonprofits. And it's a valley where, uh, you know, people who care about recreation and, and wildlife uh, are advocates for the area, and all of us uh, together uh, have a lot of similar values, like uh, preventing uh, development in the valley, you know, housing development, and, uh, and taking care of the land. We have a combination of people who have a common interest in trying to maintain a livelihood, which is ranching in this area, in harmony with wildlife and environmental conditions. Three main influences on sage grouse populations are weather events, predation, and habitat quality. Their nest could be affected by deep snowfall or, or sudden snowfall events. A severe drought year can uh, result in zero brood success. We have over a 3,000 foot elevational gradient. Lower elevations dry earlier in the summer than higher elevations which stay greener later into the summer. Coyotes and ravens are the top two predators that prey on both adults and nests as well as chicks. And then human activity, for example cattle grazing. Cattle consume herbaceous material that sage grouse rely on for nest concealment. Cattle remove that or reduce the amount of cover. So uh, we need to know more about whether there are conflicts between our grazing and uh, sage grouse productivity and, and you know, sustaining on the landscape. So uh, that's really helpful to me as a decision maker on how to operate the grazing program on the refuge. But at the same time, I think we're learning things that might not be uh, hard for uh, livestock owners to adopt on their own properties. The standard management practices for livestock grazing in conjunction with sage grouse habitat has typically been to leave residual cover behind so that it increases nesting success by reducing predation on the nest. Most people recognize, including the authors of these guidelines, that they should be adapted to each individual location. That takes a lot of work and takes a lot more investigation on the part of managers. But one of the things we hope this study contributes is to look at that residual cover question in different habitat types that produce different amounts of vegetation. In Centennial Valley, our most common is mountain big sage. Um, we have also have three tip sagebrush, uh, basin big sagebrush, and low sage. Uh, low sage has the drier environment type with less residual cover or herbaceous production, and mountain has the highest. Areas that have more moisture are able to respond more quickly to removal of vegetation and also the stature of the sage brush can affect the accessibility to cattle. Uh, Basin big sage is a taller sage brush type and has easier uh, accessibility for cattle to graze underneath under the canopy of the sage brush which sage grouse use as nesting cover and it's also in a drier habitat type so there's less residual cover available regardless of how much it was grazed. And then moving up, three tip and mountain sage are a little wetter sites and there's a lower statue of sagebrush that provides less accessibility for cattle to graze under the canopy of these shrubs. There's grazing across the landscape. We even have a, uh, grazing on the National Wildlife Refuge here, Red Rock Lakes, uh, as a prescription. It's not a, a, a right that the livestock uh, owners have to grazing. It's a, it's a, a request that we make as a, a public agency to try to manage the land. Yeah, so we're, we're members of the Centennial Valley Association, which is a, a nonprofit organization that um, is really centered around uh, helping ranches stay in business and helping this landscape stay the same as it is and has been for you know, 150 years.
I, I participate as a non-voting member uh, advising the, the chair. And uh, it gives voice to the community, uh, maybe reduces some of their anxiety to, uh, to work with uh, groups that don't have the same business as they do. And uh, I think it helps build uh, uh, trust between all the groups. And, and it's a way for us to respectfully talk about you know, what, what our goals are and see if there is an opportunity for all of us to get most of what we would like on the landscape. We started talking with our neighbors, with the Martinelles and with the Nature Conservancy and with the Refuge, uh, mainly around, focused around uh, a waterline project that needed to needed to be fixed and we all had some vested interest in seeing that come to fruition and so that that's how the whole partnership and the collaboration started uh, but then it, it's it's morphed into lots of different things including the um, participation with with different studies on the refuge and different studies on the nature conservancy and collaborative grazing plans between us and the Martinelles on our own ground, on Martinelles ground, on Nature Conservancy and Refuge. The partnership was probably the big thing, you know, it allowed, you know, us as private landowners to, to vary our grazing plan and uh, you know, give us other options for pasture that we wouldn't have had before without, you know, partnership with the Bird Refuge and, you know, other ranches. I think uh, most of the groups in the valley are getting along. Maybe not all the individuals within the livestock industry are uh, on board. Uh, not all of the environmental groups are on board and not maybe all the agency uh, are uh, totally represented. Uh, but our relationship is really good from our perspective. Uh, and it comes down to really personal relationships of trust. You know, the, the, the refuge manager really, I think, trusts us and we really trust him um, to, to be doing what's right for the land. Um, and knowing that, you know, nothing's perfect, but we don't let perfection get in the way of progress. And uh, we can have open, candid conversations about, you know, what's working, what's not working, what we need short term, what we need long term. One of the main goals of the Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education Program is trying to move agriculture in a direction that is more sustainable. So we have a very uh, good opportunity here in the Centennial Valley to conduct a study to look at how can ranchers remain profitable in this environment through livestock grazing in a manner that's compatible with the conservation of sage grouse. Therefore, the objectives of our study are to examine the effects of livestock grazing on sage grouse survival in the Centennial Valley. In order to determine where these birds are going, the types of habitats they're using, we went to their leks in the months of March and April and use night lighting uh, techniques to capture and uh, tag these birds. So we would drive up to the bird with someone shining the spotlight, a netter running behind in the darkness, jumps out of the darkness, throws a net over the bird. We, we then, bird in hand, we age the bird as either after hatch year or after second year based on wing characteristics. We attach a radio collar to its neck and then we release the bird. And then after we release the bird from capture, we record its pre-nesting movements to look at types of habitats that they're using in the early spring before they start nesting. And we follow that bird until she has a nest and then we monitor the survival of that nest until the nest either hatches or, or is destroyed. Uh, then for the nests that hatch, we follow the female sage grouse with her brood uh, and record multiple locations per week uh, until they reach approximately 30 days 
uh, a time where they become less reliant on mom and sometimes the chicks go off with other, other birds at around that time. So when they're nesting, we are taking vegetation surveys to see what they're selecting for. And then we're also looking at random locations and then where the birds are located, as well as looking at the vegetation that remains before and after grazing to see if that grazing directly influences sage grouse success. Because we know if we're gonna have a sustainable livestock operation, we have to invoke those practices that maintain the composition of native grasses as well as sagebrush species. Yeah, we have to remind ourselves a lot when we're thinking of the Nature Conservancy and the refuge ground because their, their objectives aren't totally different than ours, but they're also not in the business of putting weight on cattle like we are. They're in the business of raising wildlife habitat, and so it it, it's not mutually exclusive, but it is different. We've developed really good relationships, um, mutually beneficial relationships with the refuge and with the Nature Conservancy. And, and frankly, those leases are, are very um, critical to the success of our ranch. Uh, we, need, we need to be able to operate on those lands. And so, of course, we wanna, we wanna be able to achieve their objectives too. Um, so I think it's just a good learning opportunity for everybody. So the Western Sustainable Agriculture and Research Education Program that funded this project is trying to move agriculture into a position of being a long-term sustainable partner with environmental concerns so that we can have agricultural practices that not only provide profits for their owners, but also maintain the quality of the environment. So this project is an attempt by all the people in this valley toward that common goal of profitability, sustainability, and maintaining the quality of life that people in this valley are interested in.